Okay, uh, today we're going to talk about um, per-pixel collisions. Uh, per-pixel collisions is where we're going to look at how we can check whether one pixel on a bitmap image, so for example you play a strat sprite, in this case a rocket, um, can be checked against another image to see whether or not there's been some sort of collision that takes place. So in actual fact, visually, your images are actually hitting. All right, so in all the examples we've talked about before, there was always that element of guesswork as to whether or not visually for the player, their actual sprite was actually overlapping the thing that you were colliding with. So basic principle of per pixel collision is that we're going to take our player sprite, in this case, which is the rocket that you can see on the screen, um, and we're going to make it collide with the Earth. So how this works is that per pixel collision requires us to check every single pitch, pixel on this image um, against the appropriate place on the world image. Now we do that through a process of, first of all, we start off with our basic image, which is a rocket. But one of the things we want to be able to do is we want to be able to rotate that rocket, we want to be able to scale it, and we want to position it on the screen. And then after that, we want to check whether or not it overlaps with the world image. So the way we do this is matrix translation. And it starts off with the idea that with this, you have to do a series of translations one after another. So here's our image at the start. In the top left hand corner you'll see there's a datum. Right, this is where we would at the moment scale and rotate our image from. Now that's not ideal because our player centre point is over here. So the first thing that we do is we do a translation that moves that particular centre point to another location. So the centre of our screen in this case, centre of our image. So on doing that, that will give us the ability to um, work with our image by rotating it at the centre. Uh, at that point we can then scale it and we can rotate it. Now it is fairly important that we do these things in the right sequence so um, if you rotate and then scale that can lead in some cases to distortion. Um, so there is a sequence that you have to follow, which generally is move the center of rotation, scale, and then rotate. Okay, so to do that, we effectively have to go through the steps of moving the datum point to here, scaling the thing down or up, depending on what we want to do, preferably down because it's clearer, and then rotating it. So to do that requires a, a, a series of steps. Okay, so as you can see now, what we've done is we've scaled it down a little bit, we've rotated it around the center point. So at that point, what we have, if we use this as our reference pixel, this point here, all of that has required matrix translation. So in your code, you'll find that there are a set of matrices that are created that correspond to moving the datum point, rotating, positioning, and also um, scaling. All right. and these are all mathematically added up together to allow us to create a, an overall matrix that will do all this in one go. And we do that for both this one and the world because they both exist in this, on the screen. Now the next stage is to then take a single pixel at a time on here and check it against the world. So when we do that, what we're actually doing is we're doing two matrix translations. One that rotates, scales, etc. The, the sprites, okay, in terms of the player sprite. It then positions it on the screen and then it does a reverse translation to translate that to a pixel on the world image itself to test. So to do that, we then effectively put that pixel onto the image. We test that that pixel overlaps with that the corresponding pixel on that image. And if they both have a value greater than zero on their alpha channel, so whether or not it's transparent or not, um, 
then at that point that means that we have a collision. So that's graphically how it works. Now I'm going to pause the video for a second and then I'm going to go to Visual Studio and I'm going to talk you through how we actually achieve that in code. Okay, we're in Visual Studio now. Uh, what we've got is a class. I don't expect you to actually understand everything that goes on in here. It's just for clarity's sake so that you have some idea of how pixel collisions work. We're more interested in how it, it's implemented, which I'll show you in a minute. So to do what we just talked about, effectively what we have is we have a matrix for our player and a matrix for translating our um, world. So if they were on our screen, we have to get them in the right place and we need to be able to scale, rotate, etc. So if you look, it actually says create translation. So it starts off with create translation, date and origin, X and Y. So that puts the center point as the rotation point for our image. The next thing is it says, OK, then we're going to rotate it around the Z axis, so around its center point. And then finally, we're going to scale it. OK, and then ultimately we're going to position it at the right location on the screen. So that creates a matrix that does all of that for us. So that's for the player. The same is done for the world. Exactly the same process, but obviously with the details for that world itself. What then happens is we have a piece of code that first of all, sorry, I need to scroll up a bit, creates a special matrix, which what it does is it translates the pixel on the image as our player. It creates a translation that says, where is that pixel located on our destination, so on our world image? So by multiplying one that translates it to the screen and one that translates that pixel back to a location on the second image, we then have one that will do that for us. Very confusing, I know. It's not the easiest thing to grasp. So, very quickly, what happens here is these loops are then going through the X and Y pixels of the uh, coordinates of the original image, our player sprite. It then transforms it, and then it checks to see whether or not it actually overlaps. Okay, so if the transparency is greater than zero on our um, source image and the transparency is greater than zero on our destination image, then we've collided. Okay, so that's all that does is basically looping through the first image's pixels, translating them and checking them on the second image. Right? If that's happened, then we say what point on the image does it actually happen? And then we return um, true. Okay, so that's what that bit is there. Um, if we don't collide, then we set our um, collision point as minus one, minus one, and return false. All right, so quite complicated, I understand. But what we want to do is we want to use this collision class in our actual program. So I know it's been sort of you know, eight minutes for us to get to that point, but you needed to understand the basic principles. So I'll close the collision one because we don't need to refer to it anymore. What we've done is we've added a little bit of extra code in Abstract Sprite, which when you download this project, it'll be all there for you. All right, so you'll notice now that there's an extra bit of code in here that creates all the detail of a color array that keeps track of which um, pixels are, are white and which ones, so which ones are clear and which ones are not clear. So transparency. All right, we don't need to understand that too much apart from it just loops through the texture and creates a two-dimensional array. Of, of the image that contains the color information. All right. We've also, just for convenience, moved the um, radius variable that we were using for uh, radius collision detection into Abstract Sprite now, just for convenience. So you can just update to Abstract Sprite version 3 from this project and then you'll be able to do per pixel collision detection. So how do we actually make it work, which is obviously the thing that you really want to know. So the last five minutes of this lecture is really about how to get it to work and it's not difficult. So the first thing that we do is we need to create for our player a collision class. So to do that it's not overly complex in terms of code it just means that we have to think about what we're doing. So, um, so the variable that we're going to create we're going to call um, 
well, I think probably the easiest way is actually to call it um, pixel collision because that makes sense then, yeah? So we're creating one based on collision. All right, and we'll call it pixel collision. That's the type. Okay, and we want a new collision object. All right, there are no parameters, so we can just put uh, open and close brackets. So, oh, sorry, Mr. Keyword. Okay, so that creates a new version of collision called pixel collision that we can now use in our player object. So that means now we've got pixel pixel collision functionality ready. Now, if you remember before, we created a, a, a way of detecting collisions using um, either rectangle collision, which I've commented out, or in this case, distance collision. And our, our basic code said that if the distance was less than the two radiuses added together, then it was a hit. All right, so that's okay for round shape graphics, that works fine. But anything that's of a non-uniform shape, circular shape, it becomes problematic. So we need to add in an extra bit of code based on our pixel collision. And there's not a lot to do. So once we've detected that these things are close enough that they may have collided, we now need to detect whether actually pixels are overlapping. So to do that, we can put if, so a second test, pixel collision. Okay, so what we're doing is we're using the pixel collision object and we've got a method called pixel collision within it. Okay, and all if you look, it asks for a sprite class. All right, so if we use this, that means that we're passing it this player, the one that we're in, the current player, and then we pass, because we're looking at um, block as being our variable that holds the current thing that we're checking, the current sprite we want to see if we're colliding with. Okay, so that will return true if there's a pixel collision, or it will return false if there isn't. So put a bracket there and a bracket there so that we're actually executing those two lines of code if there's a pixel collision. Okay, so that's quite useful. That now means that we actually fully detect when there's a pixel collision. Now, just as a little extra, what we will do is we'll actually show where that collision took place. So in actual fact, which pixel. Now, it's very simple. We're going to use the mouse pointer just to keep it really easy for you to see what's going on. So if I just put in mouse, dot, and then set position, we can set the mouse pointer position based on the location of the collision. We have to cast it to an int because mouse location uses that. And then we've got the actual collision point as a variable. And then we do the same for the Y. Okay, and then at that point I'll just put semicolon on the end. And we're up and running. So now what will happen is when we get a collision, we'll find that we will be able to um, see where that collision took place because the mouse pointer will be moved on the screen. Okay, so here's our player, and just before, can you now see we now have something that indicates where that collision is? I'm pressing with the key, so collisions will change. All right, notice I've changed the background. So, can you see we've got a rotating Image there against a uh, around an animated image, and you can see the mouse pointer is moving based on where that collision pointer is. So, and that's it. That's pixel collision done. Very simple to implement in your code if you use the existing classes. All right, so you can achieve that, and you'll always know where those collisions take place. All done. Very simple. So just remember. You just need to create an instance of the pixel collision and then add in the pixel collision test, the if statement, inside the other one.